Hello and welcome to this free video lesson by Tautly.co.uk. In this lesson, we are going to go through the whole of First Language English IGCSE Paper 1 for Cambridge. So I'm going to talk you through each of the three questions, tell you what to expect and some tips and tricks for approaching them. If you like this video lesson and you want more, then keep your eyes peeled because my next video coming out will be a full paper one walkthrough where you will do a paper one with me timed and then we'll go through a market. So do subscribe if you want to see that. You can download all of the resources that you'll need at totally.co.uk, my website. You'll find a review quiz on there and you'll also find the worksheet plus other materials to help you for first language English. And if you're a teacher, then you'll also find teaching resources over there too that can help your students. Before we get stuck into the questions, let me give you a little bit of information about paper one. Now, paper one is worth 50% of your overall mark for IGCSE, with the other 50% being made up of either your paper two, which is the writing paper, or coursework, depending on what your school has decided for you. Paper one is two hours long and it is worth a total of 80 marks. It's split up into these three big questions, with question one and two having some short answer questions and question three being the longest question. So question one is when you'll have some comprehension questions, some pretty basic straightforward retrieval questions, who did this, what did this, explain this, followed by a summary writing task. Question two is when you'll have, again, some more short answer questions, but these are more vocabulary based, followed by the language analysis question. I have actually got a video for language analysis, I'll try to remember to, to link it somewhere there. And finally, question three, which is your extended response to reading. This is the big one, which is worth 25 marks. That is when you'll have to read text C and based off what you've read there, you'll have to respond to it in the form of a diary, a letter, a newspaper, a magazine, a speech or an interview. And once again, I also have got a very long 75 minute video lesson all about how to write those six text types if you would like more information about that. Now, one thing that students always ask me is, timings, how long should I take on each of these questions? I think that a general rule of thumb is, however many marks a question is worth, you should roughly be spending that amount of minutes plus about 10 minutes reading time. So if the question is worth 25 marks, so 25 minutes plus 10 minutes reading time, 35 marks, roughly, right? Because the comprehension questions and summary writing will probably take you slightly less time than extended reading. That is a rough guide though, obviously, because your comprehension questions will take you probably less than 15 minutes, whereas planning for your language analysis might take you a little bit more than the 15 minutes plus 10. Anyway, here are my suggested timings. So question one, the comprehension questions, about 15 minutes, it's worth 15 marks. Yes, you'll have to read the text, but I do recommend that you skim read through that. Then the summary writing question, I recommend you spend about 20 minutes on it. Summary writing is worth 15 marks. Um, so there it is only five minutes of reading, but that's because you're only writing 120 words. So actually probably it won't take you 15 minutes to write that summary. Probably it will be closer to 10 minutes of reading and planning and 10 minutes of writing. The vocabulary questions, the short answer questions for question two, again, these are worth 15 marks. So spend about 15 minutes on them. Then the vocabulary questions. Now I've given you a little bit longer for this one because this is when you'll have to read your text C for the first time, which is the longest text and also the text that you'll have to answer language analysis and question three on. So although vocabulary questions are only worth 10 marks and you're just writing down one word, so it should be actually quite quick to answer those questions, needing to tackle that text C for the first time, I'm gonna allocate you slightly longer. Next, question two, language analysis, which is worth 15 marks. So you can figure out from that, okay, 15 marks, 15 minutes, plus 10 minutes of planning time. And then question three is worth 25 marks, so 25 minutes of writing, plus 10 minutes of reading. Um, you do really want to make sure that you leave enough time for that question three. I remember invigilating the second half of the first language exam for my year 11s last year. So I was coming in as they were finishing their exam and walking down the rows and seeing some of them with just 20 minutes left of the exam, just turning the page onto question three and thinking, oh no. So don't be like that. Question three is worth the most marks by itself, right? The other ones are kind of split up into two different halves. So do make sure that you spend enough time on your question three. And you'll also notice that I've put in there five to 10 minutes of proofreading at the end. I warned my students, 10 minutes of proofreading at the end. And once again, as I was invigilating, saw some of them, they finished their question three, 
there was 10-15 minutes to go, their exam booklets were closed and they were staring off into the air and obviously as an invigilator I couldn't say anything, I couldn't show any emotion but inside, <laughs> inside I was not a happy woman. So make sure that you do spend a little bit of time proofreading at the end, please. Grade boundaries, just so you're aware. So these here are the grade boundaries for summer 2023, the most recent exam as of the time making this video. And if you're wondering what 11, 12, 13 refer to, the one means paper one, right? And the second number means the variant because in each like different exam block, there will be three different versions of the paper so that different time zones can't cheat ahead of time, right? So obviously all paper ones are out of 80 marks. Now, if you were sitting variant one or variant two, then you only needed 47 out of 80 to get an A. Um, similar marks for a B, 40 or 41, 33 or 35 for a C, 28 or 29 for a D, and 23 for an E. And then if you were sitting paper one, three, this paper must have been harder because the grade boundaries are much lower. You only needed 43 out of 80, just over 50% to get an A. Um, and you can have a look at the rest of the numbers right there. If you're wondering what about an A star, you can't actually get an A star in a single component. Like you can't get an A star in your paper one or an A star in your coursework. It's only when those two marks are put together that you will be awarded an A star. So to put this into percentages, if we just have a look at paper one, to get an A, you needed 58. To get a B, 50%, that is it. 44 for a C. So you can see that these gray boundaries are actually really shockingly, surprisingly low. That's balanced by the fact that Cambridge are relatively harsh in their marking. So I'm saying this to reassure you that if you don't always get a very high mark or you're not always getting in the top band, right? You can still get an A because sometimes you only need like 52% to get an A. <laughs> so if that makes you feel a little bit better going into your exam, then cool. And also do remember that if you have a hard exam, you come out and they've asked you to write a report or something that everyone isn't quite prepared for, no one else in your time zone is likely to be prepared for it. And so you might have a nice low gray boundary like on summer, paper one, variant three. So just use that to reassure yourself as you go in. If you are finding it hard, others are finding it hard, which means great, great boundaries, extra super low for you, probably. Now let's get stuck into the questions. So firstly, we are having a look at question one and the comprehension questions. So the comprehension questions are questions 1A to E. And for this, you'll have to read text A. Now text A is usually the shortest and the simplest. You have three texts and they get gradually more difficult as you go through the paper. So based on the simplest text, you'll have to answer short comprehension questions. So this should be a relatively easy uh, section of your paper for you. The question is worth a total of 15 marks, therefore spend about 15 minutes answering it, five minutes to skim read over text A and 10 minutes to actually write. My recommended technique is to skim and scan the questions and the text first before you methodically work through question by question. Now, text A isn't gonna be coming up again. You don't need to know it in depth. All you need to do is just find the answers, write them down and move on. So don't spend a long time deeply reading and deeply analyzing this text because you just need to quickly find some information and write it down on your exam paper. Um, unless it says using your own words, and it will say that and it will say it in bold, just directly copy from the text. Save time, don't lose any marks. Do not write in full sentences unless it's for those last two explain questions. All of the rest will be bullet points, right? So actually the mark scheme is usually the correct answer is like one to five words. So don't waste time writing out big long sentences. Be more efficient. If you can get the mark by writing down two words, why on earth would you write down 20, right? This is all about maximizing time for later on in the exam. So my last bullet point then, don't waste too much time on this first question. Get your marks, get out. Question 1A is a simple retrieval. Find some information. Find one or two pieces of information from the text and copy it down directly. So it will say something like this. Give two possible meanings of the dot languages found on cave paintings and you will just copy down a phrase from the text. So you can see that it doesn't say using your own words, so copy, and we've got bullet points. So there's no need for full sentences and you need to get both of the pieces of information to get one mark. If you get one of the bullet points wrong and the other one right, sorry, but you get zero marks. 
Question 1b is when you will have to explain the meaning of two phrases from the text. Um, so you need to make sure that you explain both parts of the quote. It will always be like a phrase, a short phrase. So for example here, you have to explain using your own words what track the migration means. So you need to give a synonym of track and a synonym of migration. Now, one thing that my students often get wrong with this question is because it's saying, oh, this phrase in the text, they kind of go back and they look at it in the sentence and they think, okay, what does it mean in this sentence? And they start to analyze it a little bit, but actually it's not that deep. You just need to define the words or give synonyms. You do not need to analyze. So you will literally give a synonym for track, like follow, and a synonym for migration, movement of animals. That's it. Because it says using your own words, you must use your own words and do not reuse the word in your definition. So for example, to define track, you obviously shouldn't say by tracking the movement of birds because you're reusing track in your own definition. So make sure that you're using completely different words and you're just simply giving synonyms. That's all. This question actually is deceptively easy as long as you know what the words mean. Moving on for question 1c and 1d, the first question in 1d. This is once again a simple retrieval. So you need to find two pieces of information from the text. And because it doesn't say using your own words, you should copy directly from the text. Because it's using bullet points, we can see we don't need to use full sentences either. So it will direct you to a paragraph here, reread paragraph three and reread paragraphs four and five. This is why I'm saying you don't need to in depth read the text because you can just skim read over your questions and then say, okay, the answer to this question is in paragraph three. Now you read paragraph three in detail. Okay, now I need to analyze paragraph four and five, read that in detail. See how it can help you go a little bit faster. So here, relatively simple, as long as you can find the answer, find the answer, keep it short, copy it down, done. <laughs> For the second part of question D, you will need to explain three pieces of information from the text. Now, these pieces of information, we can see it doesn't give us a paragraph, so it could be from anywhere in the text. It will probably be in the latter half of the text though. Um, and you can use keywords from the text. So you can use short phrases from the text, but it should be mostly in your own words. So if, for example, it's about cave paintings and the dots, we can say the phrase cave paintings, dots, scientists, whatever the text says but most of it should be in our own words. Now we can see that it's worth three marks. In order to get all three marks, you have to make three different points. So you have to give three different ways how scientists will approach decoding the significance of the cave dots. So basically a mark per point. So you need to make sure if the question is worth three marks, you say in at least three different points about it. And actually there's no reason why to make sure that you're doing this you can't just do your own bullet points. Like, why not? And then you can make sure that you've definitely made three different points. On the mark scheme, remember that points that are a little bit similar might be grouped together. So make sure that your three points are very distinct and individual so that you're not repeating the same idea. Finally, question 1e is quite similar. You are once again explaining three pieces of information from the text, but now it should be entirely in your own words because it's saying using your own words in bold. Once again, it's worth three marks, that's worth three different points. You could still write in bullet points, that would be fine, as long as you are still using your own words and not copying from the text. My key takeaways for question one comprehension questions are, unless it says using your own words, you should directly copy from the text. Skim and scan the text, do not waste time. The number of marks means the number of separate points that you should make. And remember that when you are defining words, don't reuse the original word in your definition. Always try to say everything in your own words without repeating from the text. Moving on now to the second half of question one, which is summary writing. Summary writing, also known as question 1F, is when you will have to write a short focus summary based on the text that you've read. So we'll be moving on to the second text now, text B, which will be a little bit harder than text A, but still not too difficult. Um, and you will have to write a summary based on this. Now, Cambridge will give you a question, so you're not just summarizing the whole text, you are only summarizing information that relates to the question. This question is worth 15 marks. You should spend about 20 minutes answering it, 10 minutes to read and plan, and 10 minutes to write, because you only need to write 120 words. Now, depending on the size of your handwriting, that I would expect to be about this much, right? Certainly you should not be writing more than the first sheet of paper. 
You can see that the question takes up about a third of the page, so this is about enough. 120 words, but please do not waste time <laughs> counting your words. The examiner doesn't count. It is a complete and utter waste of time. It is pointless. Don't do it. Simply eyeball it. You should write about this much. <laughs> like my drawing, about this much on your paper. As an examiner, that's what I would look for. Here is my recommended technique for summary writing. First, read the summary question so that as you're reading the text for the first time, you already know what you're focusing on, what is relevant and what isn't relevant to the summary that you will need to write. As you read through the text, do be highlighting for the answers as you go along. Remember that this is a focus summary, so only include relevant information to your question. After you've read through and you've highlighted and you think you found all of the answers, then you need to quickly decide which points belong together, which points will flow together, which points do you think should go next to each other, which points do you think belong in paragraph one and paragraph two, if you're going to paragraph, right? You might want to think, okay, so these points are all about, I don't know, the physical body, and these points are all about mental health, and then you might do a quick little uh, like key at the side and go, okay, a star means physical, and a heart means like mental. And then as you go through the margin, just quickly star, heart, star, heart. And that will act as a plan so you know which points you're going to put together. You should be aiming to get around 10 individual points in order to answer your question. The mark scheme will usually have between 10 to 15 possible correct answers. And so in order to maximize your chance of getting 10 out of 10 content points, you should try to make sure you've got 10 individual points that answer your question. For summary, I know it's tempting, but please, no introduction, no conclusion. They are not only not needed, a waste of your word count, but you will get a lower mark for including irrelevant information. So just directly get into your summary. Every single sentence that you write in your summary should have a purpose. In other words, it should have a point from the mark scheme. If I'm reading your summary and I see a sentence that doesn't have any content points in, I'm already thinking, mm, irrelevant, excess right? So you're going to get a lower mark. So make sure every single sentence you think has got an answer in that answers the question. Now, a big part of summary writing is paraphrasing. In other words, writing things in your own words. It's really important that you try wherever possible to use your own words and do not copy. So general advice, you must try to write in your own words wherever possible. It's not always possible, right? So if you don't know a synonym, you think, okay, the word glittering, I don't know a synonym for it. Er, maybe it could be dazzling, but I'm not sure. If you're not 100% sure, just write glittering because otherwise you could lose the content point because you've changed the meaning. So unless you're sure, don't use a synonym. And also sometimes it's not actually possible to use a good synonym for very precise nouns. Think about words like mammoth or cave painting. What synonym could you possibly do there, right? A synonym of mammoth? Ancient, prehistoric, elephant-like mammal. I've lost meaning, right? So it's better in that case just to copy down mammal, uh, mammoth, right? Don't overcomplicate things. Similarly, cave painting, artwork crafted on the walls. I can't, even, I can't think of a synonym for cave of rocky in, ha, uh, rock, rocky abodes. See then, not only have I made it longer, I've made it less precise, I've lost the content point and everyone is confused. So sometimes just copy. So as I said, that is for very precise nouns usually. Well, how do you even paraphrase? Use synonyms where possible. You can even switch around the sentence structures. If you don't know a synonym, you can just say, if the original quote was, woolly mammoths um, lived in prehistoric times, which scientists are just discovering more about today. You can switch it around and go, scientists are discovering more today about woolly mammoths that lived in prehistoric times. So I've just switched the sentence order around, but most of the words are the same. But the examiner knows, okay, they've kind of tried. <laughs> You're at least not going to get like two out of five, right? You might be able to get a three out of five because you've tried a little bit. You should also change around the order of ideas from the original text. So don't just copy chronologically from the text. If like your first point shouldn't be from the first paragraph and then second point from the second paragraph and third point from the third paragraph. Try to change around the ideas so that similar points are grouped together. 
like I was saying before, all, all of these points relate to mental health, so I'm going to put them together, and all of these points relate to physical health, so I'm going to put them together. Do make sure that you keep the meaning the same. Really, the aim of the summary is to give a concise, short piece of text that explains something, right? And if you're changing the meaning, you've not really completed the task. So that's really important too. You're being short, you're being accurate, you're grouping points which are similar, you're switching around the sentence structures and you're using synonyms where possible. That is basically good paraphrasing and good summary writing. Here is an example question now. Let's have a look. Read text B, the world's oldest pig painting. In the insert and an answer question 1F. According to text B, what makes the cave painting so remarkable and what do scientists hope to learn by studying the cave painting? We've got 10 marks for content and five marks for our writing. So quite often I see these days that the summary question will be this and this, right? So here we've got what makes the cave painting so remarkable and what do scientists hope to learn by studying the cave painting? If that happens, what I re recommend you do is you have just two short paragraphs. There you are grouping your ideas. It is make, making logical sense. It is a good structure. So just very simply have two short paragraphs. It's not always necessary to have two paragraphs, like one focused paragraph is absolutely fine. But certainly if the question is this and this, two paragraphs is best. I just said that you get 10 marks for content and five marks for writing. Eh, how is that marked? Like, what does that mean? So for content points, it's basically how many points from the mark scheme did you identify? So it's not directly like, if you get 10 marks from the mark scheme, you get 10 different points from the original text, you might not actually get 10 out of 10 if you've not organized your work well, if you've included lots of excess information, right? So yes, you need to have roughly about 10 different points to get 10 out of 10, but like you could copy down the whole text and get all 10 points, that isn't necessarily a good summary. So it's a, a rough rule of thumb. Yes, you need to get 10 points to get 10 marks, but you also need to have a good summary where you're focusing on the question. So how well did you stay focused on the question and was there excess irrelevant information? When I mark this on mock exams for my students, any sentences that do not have a point from the mark scheme in, I cross out. I'm like, this sentence was excess. You did not answer your question. You did not achieve anything with this sentence. And that has made some of my students very sad because they did have 10, or in one student's case, 13 points from the mark scheme, but also half of their summary was like totally irrelevant. So they didn't get 10 out of 10, sorry. And then next writing, which is worth five marks. So this is, did you write in your own words? How well did you paraphrase and use synonyms? And did you effectively group the ideas together so that your summary flowed? It should feel like a natural progression through the summary. This point links to this point links to this point and not just copying down in a chronological order. My key takeaways for summary writing, question 1F. So you are writing a focused summary of a specific aspect of the text, not just summarizing the whole text generally. Aim to get between 10 to 12 individual points for your summary. Don't repeat points or you will lose marks for focus and concision because you are not focusing on the question and you are not being concise. Remember to group together similar ideas. You can group those together by putting them in the same paragraph, one sentence after the other. You could even join them together in the same sentence by using a conjunction or a semicolon. Don't include irrelevant information that does not answer the question. Remember that you should not be copying or quoting. Use your own words wherever possible. So it should be 99% your own words. Don't change the meaning of the original text. Be short and concise. And usually it's best not to use synonyms for very precise nouns or you might lose the content point because you might have changed the meaning too much. We are one third of the way through. Now on to question two, looking at those short answer vocabulary questions. The vocabulary questions on question two will be based on text C, which as I said earlier is the big text because you will answer these vocabulary questions on it, your language analysis on it, and your big question three on it. So it is the most important text, therefore I'm gonna give you a little bit more reading time on this. So five minutes to read and 10 minutes to write. The question is worth 10 marks. 
For the first four questions in question two, that's 2A, you need to find the correct word or phrase from the text and just copy it down directly. So it will say something like this. Identify a word or phrase from the text which suggests the same idea as the words underlined, smoothly drifted across. So you will go back to text C and you will just find those words or phrases and you will copy it down. Some students make the mistake here of defining it using their own words. No, 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 no. You need to copy it down or you will not get the mark. You also need to make sure that it is the same as the words underlined. If you include any excess information, extra information that isn't the same as the words underlined, you will lose that mark even if you have the correct phrase there as well. So make sure you're really careful not to copy down anything extra that isn't underlined. So question 2A was, here's a phrase, find it in the text, copy it down. Question 2B is kind of the reverse, it's here's a phrase from the text, define it in your own words. So you are literally just gonna give a synonym for the word in the text in your own words. Remember the same as for question one, you must not reuse the word in your own definition. So for rugged, you can't say someone looks very rugged and outdoorsy, right? Because you've reused the word rugged in your own definition. Do make sure that you read the word in context because it might have a slightly different meaning in the extract. That's why they've given you the paragraph so you can define it according to its meaning in this paragraph. So for example, down here for rugged, I might write rough, but handsome. And that would be correct. So it might take more than one word to define it in some cases like this. Sometimes it's literally just one word. So once again, you don't need full sentences. You don't need to write the word rugged means literally write down your synonyms, move on. You're trying to save time for later on with these short answer questions. Ah, uh, and then we're on to question 2C. I, I feel like out of all of the questions, this is only worth three marks, but it's the one that my students get the most stressed and confused about. And I'm like, it's a three marker. So let me try to explain it as clearly as I can. For question 2C, you will have to explain the effect of a short quote. So let's look at an example. It says, use one example from the text below to explain how the writer suggests Jake's experiences and feelings that night. Use your own words in your explanation. And then we've got a couple of sentences. So, okay, it says use one example. So that means that I need to find one quotation. Um, so I need to find one quotation about how Jake's experiences and feelings that night. So let's see. Okay, we paddled on in silence, each lost in our own thoughts. So maybe I'm going to do the quote, lost in our own thoughts. Cool. So now what I need to do is I need to say three different things about lost in our own thoughts. So I could say that they are all contemplating, that they're together, but they are alone because they're, they're so consumed by their own thought process. Um, and I could say it's quite a peaceful, somber scene. So literally I've got this quote and I'm just gonna say three different things about it. That's all. They don't need to be particularly deep things. So you've got one quote, say three different things about that quote. You don't need to analyze its inferences. What does it suggest? Three different things that the quote could suggest. Now a common mistake that students make is they do more than one quote. You should only have one quote or they don't write a quote at all. So if you don't have a quote at all, you cannot get even one mark. So no quote, no marks, right? If you write more than one quote, the examiner will just take whichever one is your best quote and mark you for that and ignore the other ones. So my advice for this question is one quote only and then just say three different things about it. They don't need to be that deep. Three different things that it suggests. My key takeaways for the vocabulary questions on question two. For question 2a, just copy the phrase from the text. For question 2b, remember that when you are defining, don't reuse the original word in your definition. For question 2c, number of marks means the number of separate points you need to make, so it's worth three marks, say three different things about the quotation. And also for question 2c, you must only have one quote. Now on to our brief whistle-stop tour of question two language analysis. Once again, there is a link to my longer, more detailed video about this question if you are interested. Language analysis, also known as question 2D. So based on text C, you will need to analyze the use of imagery in two paragraphs from text C. 
So this text, remember, is the most important text because we're going to answer question three in it. You know this now. And language analysis is worth 15 marks. So I recommend that you should spend about 20 minutes writing and five minutes rereading and planning. Uh, but do make sure that you have a quick chance to reread those paragraphs, highlight the quotations that you're going to analyse and make a few notes about the arguments that you're going to make. I don't know if you guys can see, but my cat, <laughs> my cat has got the zoomies right now. Okay, so here is an example question 2D. Um, so it will look something like this. Reread paragraphs one and two. Paragraph one begins lights up in New York City. Paragraph two begins in a dizzying spin. Explain how the writer uses language to convey meaning and to create effect in these paragraphs. Choose three examples of words and phrases from each paragraph to support your answer. Your choices should include the use of imagery. Write about 200 to 300 words and there are 15 marks available for the content of your answer. So you will be given two paragraphs to analyse from text C. You must only answer from those two paragraphs. Do not answer from elsewhere in the text. You're picking three images from each paragraph, so that means you have to pick six images in total. And you're explaining the meaning of the quote, literally, what does it mean? And you're analysing the effect of the image. You should analyse word choices, what powerful words have been used and what is their effect on the reader. And you do not need to pick out any language devices. Which brings me nicely onto my do nots. For this question, do not try to be too clever. I'm going to give you a structure in a second. You use this structure, you do not deviate from it, you do not try to use your own brain because Cambridge does not appreciate that for this question. You just need to follow the structure that I give you. Remember that you do not need to look for language devices. So you don't need to pick out similes or metaphors or as my year 11s once did, hi Jigsaw, can you see what he's doing? <laughs> or as my year 11s once did, you do not need to look out for semantic fields, right? It is not that deep. You are just saying, here is an image. This is what it means. This is the effect, move on. Do not analyze the other paragraphs. Do not give more than three images per paragraph and do not deviate from the structure that I am about to teach you. Here is the structure then. This is how to answer question 2D. Firstly, you will give an overall effect sentence where you say, what is the overall effect of the paragraph? What is the writer trying to make the reader feel in that paragraph as a whole? One sentence. Then you will give a quotation. Your quotation should be a strong, juicy image from the text because you have to have the quotations that are in the mark scheme, otherwise you lose the marks. So make sure when you're picking out these quotations that you're like, surely this has got to be in the mark scheme, right? This quote is too wonderful for Cambridge not to have included it. So be careful there. Then you need to tell me what is the meaning of the quotation, the literal meaning, right? Think about all of these definition questions we've had so far. Cambridge really wants to see that you understand, okay, what is an image? What does it literally mean? And what does it implicitly mean? What does it suggest? So they're looking for those layers of understanding. So you'll give a definition or a synonym um, to explain the meaning of the quotation that you've picked. Then you'll do connotations. So pick out a powerful word and say it's connotations. Remember, connotations means what you associate with a word, what it makes you think of, right? And finally, you will say the effect. What is the effect of the quotation? What does it suggest? What would the reader feel and why? Now you'll see here that obviously you've got to do three images. So this is a paragraph, right? You'll do overall effect sentence and then you will do this bit times three and then you'll repeat the whole thing again for your second paragraph. What does that look like? Here is an example of what a A-star response to question two looks like. The overall effect of paragraph 10 is to show a magical and romanticized view of the underwater world. Firstly, the image of shell encrusted means that the doorstep was completely covered by shells. This has connotations of being decorated by gems, showing how precious the location is and how the hotel blends in with its natural surroundings. So here I've got my overall effect sentence. Then I've got my first image. So this is my image, my quotation. Then I've explained what it means, right? So what is the literal explicit meaning? Then I've picked out the connotations, you know, what does the quote have connotations of? What does it um, have associations with? And then finally, in the underlying bit, I've said the effect. Carrying on. Secondly, the image of clownfish darting means that the fish are rapidly zigzagging all over. Darting has connotations of being agile, light and free, and this might reflect Jenny's own excitement. 
Finally, the image of the anemone. I don't, I hate this word, anemone's swirling fingers means that they are twisting and wrapping around. Swirling has connotations of magic and dancing, suggesting that even the landscape is performing for Jenny. So if you're looking here, this is like the explicit meaning, right? And then this is the implicit effect. Technically, you don't need to do connotations to get an A star, but I find that connotations are like a safety net for students because when they do the connotations, they're either not doing it correctly and giving definitions, but that's showing that you understand the meaning, or they are doing it correctly, which shows that you understand the effect. So I, I really highly suggest that you do do connotations, pick out one word, give three different things that it suggests that you associate with it, that will help you to get a better mark, in my experience. And here are some sentence starters. Feel free to take a screenshot if you like, um, or you can download the PowerPoint from my website, linked below. <laughs> uh, so you can just use these sentence starters in your exam. Like I said, you don't need to be clever for this question. Cambridge don't want you to be clever for this question. So the overall effect of this paragraph is to suggest, firstly, the image of quote means that, give your explanation, your definition, the word, has connotations of blah, blah, and blah, which suggests that effect. And you'll repeat that three times, and then you'll do it again for your second paragraph. You are welcome. <laughs> now, how are you marked for this question? Um, I tried to boil it down a little bit for you. Basically, to get in the top band, you need to have six quotations from the mark scheme, right? So three for each paragraph that are in the mark scheme. You need to have five or more meanings of those quotations and you need to have five or more effects of those quotations which are imaginative. So basically you're doing everything basically perfectly. You've got your quotations, you explain the meaning for all of them and you have imaginative, insightful points about the effect of all of them. Maybe one of them doesn't quite hit, but all of the rest do. Then to get into band four, you'll have five or more quotations. Um, you'll have four or more meanings and four or more effects, which are no longer that imaginative, but they're clear, it makes sense, not particularly clever, but yeah, sure, it means that. <laughs> then moving down, we've got five or more quotations, we've given three meanings, and we've got mm, zero to three effects, and the effects are pretty basic. So see now, we still need to have the quotations, you still can't get a good mark unless you've got these big juicy quotes in your answer, but here we're not really getting the effect as much and we're not always saying the meaning. And then down here, we've got four or more quotations. Maybe you're giving the meaning of one or two words and again, it's basic and you've got no effects. So you need to really follow my structure and do it well, do it clearly. And if you do it all accurately, you should be able to get in the top band. But if you don't do it, if you forget to say the meaning, if you don't say the effect, if your quotes are on the mark scheme, you're really gonna struggle to get into that band four or band five. Here are my key takeaways for question 2D, your language analysis question. Firstly, very importantly, the overall effect, my structure. So we're gonna go overall effect plus quote, meaning connotations effect times three. Reminder, do not analyze language devices. It is not needed. The examiner wants to see that you understand both the literal meaning of the image and also the deeper implicit meaning, the effect. Analyze only from the two paragraphs that you've been assigned, so don't analyze elsewhere. And make sure that your quotes are powerful enough to definitely be on that mark scheme. Finally, now we are onto question three, the extended response, the big question on your first language English paper one. So question three is also called the extended response. You will write about two to four sides of writing depending on your handwriting size, responding to text C in the format of one of these following text types. So you could be asked to write a letter, a newspaper report, a journal, a speech, a interview or a magazine article. Journal, diary, same meaning. Also, if you are doing paper two, then a magazine article, a speech or a letter could also come up on your paper too. So well worth revising these um, different text types. When I say two to four sides, I mean sides of A4 paper, right? So if this is your exam booklet, I would expect to see as a minimum that you have filled two sides of paper for this question, depending on your size of handwriting. 
I think lots of students do write two or three sides. Some students with big handwriting might write three sides. Occasionally, if a student has got very big handwriting or they're just a quick writer, you might see four sides. But certainly two sides of A4 is what I would expect to see. Question three is your biggest question. So make sure that you save plenty of time for it. Don't leave yourself with like 10 minutes at the end to try and write two sides of A4 and have no time to plan, no time to skim read. Do not do that. So it's worth 25 marks. So obviously at least 25 minutes on the question plus reading and planning time. So therefore I suggest that you spend between 35 to 40 minutes answering it. 10 minutes to reread and plan, 30 minutes to actually write your response in an ideal world. Now for this question, you get 10 marks for reading and 15 marks for writing. Beginning with writing marks then. In the top band, in order to get 10 out of 10 for writing, which of course we all want, you have to have an effective register for audience and purpose. So do you actually sound like the character you've been asked to write as? Do you actually sound like you are writing a school magazine for a school audience, right? You need to sound like you are the right character writing the right text type um, for the right purpose. Your language needs to sound convincingly and consistently appropriate. For example, one of the mock exams that we did recently had a waiter, a, wait a waiter in it, and the waiter was like, seemed about 30-ish, just a normal lady. And one of my students wrote her, <laughs> her diary where she was saying, so anyways, oh my God. And nowhere in the text did that waiter ever use that language. So it wasn't, cons it wasn't convincing. It didn't sound like the character. So the top two bullet points then are all about sounding like the characters, sounding convincing, being appropriate. Next then is about the quality of your writing. So are your ideas firmly expressed with a wide range of effective and or interesting language? So are you explaining yourself very clearly in an interesting way? Maybe some nice sentence types, some nice punctuation, some sophisticated vocabulary. And have you structured and sequenced your work well? So basically, have you paragraphed correctly and do your paragraphs flow nicely from one to the next? Now, this is the mark scheme for 2024 paper one because on from 2024 onwards, you are no longer marked for spelling, punctuation and grammar. But if you are sitting this exam in November 2023, which a few of you might be, you are also marked for spelling, punctuation and grammar. So be aware of that. But if you're from 2024 onwards, very nice. <laughs> Just make sure that you're sounding like the text type and character. You're trying to use some interesting vocabulary and that you paragraph correctly. Now, to help you do that, I do recommend that you think about your VORP. Again, I've got a video on this. VORP stands for Voice, Audience, Register, Purpose and Format. So voice, who are you writing as? Whose voice are you trying to take on? Which character have you been asked to write as? Audience, who are you writing to? Okay, so if I am a 30 year old waiter, but I'm writing for a local newspaper, that's a very different audience to if I was writing a letter to my mother, right? So that would really affect the vocabulary and language choices. For register, you're thinking about how formal or informal should your language be? Purpose, why are you writing? Are you writing to discuss, to persuade, argue, inform, entertain, describe, narrate, analyze, not gonna come up, right? So you really need to think why you are writing and how that affects your language choices. And finally, what format have you been asked to write? A letter, magazine, diary, interview, speech, so on and so forth. So by unpicking the VORP, this will help you to decide what writing style will work best for the task that Cambridge have given you. Let's look at an example question three then. What is the VORP? So reread text C face to face with a royal Bengal in the insert and then answer question three on this question paper. You are the Igua. After a near miss in Lalpani, you have been asked to write a report for the village council, offering an explanation of what went wrong on the hunt and how you can avoid it in the future. You should cover the following three points in your report. The conditions which led to the attack, your role in saving Binod, what recommendations you would make for future hunts. Write your report. Base it on what you have read in text here, but be careful to use your own words. Address each of the three bullet points. Okay, so voice, who am I writing as? So my voice is a Gua, right? So I will need to go back through the text and carefully look what sort of personality they have. How do they speak in the text in terms of dialogue? What kind of voice do I think that they would have? 
the audience. So the audience is for the village council, right? So that is my audience. So that makes it quite formal, right? It's quite a professional context, people that might be of a higher status than me, more professional context. So I need to make sure that my language is nice and formal for that. So therefore my register is going to be more formal. The purpose, okay, so I'm giving an explanation. So my purpose is to explain and also how we can avoid it in the future. So also perhaps to make some suggestions. So purpose, explain and suggest. And then my format, I have been asked to write a report. So again, a report is quite a formal text type to be asked to write. You're being very factual, very unemotional, very unbiased. So all of these come together in my vault to help me figure out what language choices Cambridge are looking for to help me to get that 10 out of 10. Now, how about structure? This is basically how you should always structure your question three, except if they ask you to write an interview. If you are asked to write an interview, you do not need an introduction and you do not need a conclusion. But for all of the other text types, follow this structure. So you need to make sure that you write about the bullet points equally. If we go back and have a look at the question, Cambridge will always give you three bullet points. Now, what my students do is they write loads for bullet point one maybe five sentences for bullet point two. Bullet point three, they've run out of time, they've written one sentence, bye-bye. <laughs> and unless you get three separate ideas on the mark scheme for each of the three bullet points, you cannot get beyond 10 out of 15, right? It is not possible. So you have to write about the three bullet points equally. You have to give them all the same amount of time and consideration. That's why planning your time, leaving enough time for question three is so important. My suggestion to make sure that you do this is to write one paragraph per bullet point and that way you can very visibly see I've written loads about bullet point one but not very much about bullet point three, right? So one paragraph per bullet point. Um, you can write a very short introduction and conclusion that can literally be two sentences long. Like don't spend too much time on this, it's not super important. Um, it's just to kind of help you get started, maybe show off a little bit of your warmth, right? but you're getting all of your reading points from bullet point one, two, and three, your three big paragraphs in the middle. So this structure, super important. I think almost, if you remember nothing else about this video lesson for all of the questions, like if you could only take away one thing, it would be this. This is, this is your 25 mark question. And so if you can really maximize your marks in this 25 mark question, this would be how I would say that you would do it. This is what I drill over and over again in my own students of answer all three bullet points equally one paragraph per bullet point. Do you remember it now? Remember it? Very important. Take a screenshot, <laughs> stick it up on your bedroom wall. This structure is now your God. It is the shrine, the holy shrine to first language English. Okay, let's move on. So for reading, which is worth 50 marks, this is what the top band looks like you have got a thorough evaluation and analysis of the text. Now you can't be thorough if you have ignored one of the bullet points, right? So important. You have developed ideas that are well related to the text. We're gonna talk about this more late, later on, but it's basically you need to take some of the ideas and develop them, but it has to be realistic and it, you can't make things up, but you do have to develop a little bit implicit details. You've got a wide range of ideas. So you've got lots and lots of little details from the text, supporting detail throughout, which is well integrated. You have got all three bullet points well covered. See, that's why my structure is so important. And you have got a consistent and convincing voice. If they have asked you to write as Jigsaw the Cat, but instead you write as Sarah the Teacher, you have not got a convincing voice, you are gonna lose marks, right? So make sure you read that question really carefully. A common mistake is students just assume, okay, I have to write as the main character. Actually, usually it's the opposite. It's too easy to write as the main character. Cambridge will usually have you write as a side character or a local journalist or something like that. So make sure you double, triple, quadruple check who the voice is. So then I've said you need to have details and development and also the content points, right? So here, developed details. What does that mean? So content points is basically the points of the mark scheme that you need to get. So if the question was, why nighttime photographs can be better than those taken in the day? The answer would be the light of the moon and the effects of artificial light. These are your content points, right? 
Now the content points will be summarized in your own words. You will never be able to copy this from the text. It has to be something that you write yourself, a synonym or summary in your own words. Has to be, or, or you will not get the content point. The details then are explicit information that you could highlight in the text. This is usually your who, what, where, why, when, sorry, your who, what, where, how. So you can see here in the mark scheme, details, harvest moon, glowing cast, celestial pumpkin, amazing colors. These are all things that the text says. I could read the text and I could highlight them. They are my details. Then I'll take those details and turn it into a content point. Okay, so harvest moon, the glowing cast of the moon, the celestial pumpkin, the amazing colors of the moon. How am I gonna summarize that? Light of the moon, right? Finally, development, which is developing implicit information that you need to infer. This is usually why someone did something, like their motivations, how they felt about something, or their reactions. So stuff that it won't clearly say, but that you can probably figure out. So you can't highlight the development that comes from you. But it needs to be sensible. You can't completely make stuff up. For example, one of my students who in a question three all about a geography teacher who pulls a fire alarm bell because she's so stressed that she doesn't want to teach her students. One of my students like five years ago wrote, <laughs> it was actually quite funny and well written, but he wrote this piece all about how the teacher had done it on purpose as a revenge because these students had just messed with her too much and it was their turn to learn who Miss Salmon really was. But there was no evidence anywhere in the text that she was that type of character or felt that way. So he developed incredibly inaccurately and lost a lot of reading marks because it made me feel like he didn't actually understand the text. So for example, development in this mark scheme says, okay, the moon varies according to the season or it's beautiful. You know, how do you feel about it? Light of the moon, moon is beautiful. Not that deep, right? So basically, you should try to annotate to get to this. So what I recommend you do is when you get into the exam hall and you've got your question, get a highlighter, three different highlighters, highlight bullet point one in one color, bullet point two in another color, bullet point three in another color. Then as you read through the text, have your three highlighters ready and just highlight anything related to bullet point one in yellow, anything related to bullet point two in pink, anything related to bullet point three in green. And then you can very clearly see, okay, this, these points belong together in my first paragraph and so on. So assign a highlighter color to each bullet point and highlight for each of the three bullet points. Now remember, as I said, anything that you can highlight, these are your details. Next, you will need to think about how these details you could summarize into a broader idea in your own words. This will become your content point. So for example, here is one that I did. So um, as Hua stepped out of the dining room, she met two further guests. Um, and then a description of the guests. So I summarize that as there are guests in the garden, right? Then over here, they're talking about room four is upstairs. Summarized in my own words, there is guest accommodation, right? So you need to take those details and just put them in your own words. It's usually a bigger, broader idea. Details are usually quite specific. Finally, you'll need to think about what these ideas show about how or why something happened or how a character felt about it. And that will be our development. So for example, down here, the details are that the hotel is near a river and a newly built theater. The development might be, it's a very beautiful town that is up and coming, right? So that's some relevant development based on the text. It's not completely random, but it's also not clearly said either. One final thing to note is that for bullet point three, that is often implicit. So it's often not clearly said in the text. So if you can't highlight a lot for bullet point three, please don't panic. It might be something like suggest plans for the future, suggest how you will improve da da da. And that won't be said in the text. So you will need to have a look and see, okay, what are the problems? So how might those be solved in the future? So what might she do next, right? So don't panic if you can't highlight too much for bullet point three. Here are my key takeaways for question three. In bold, answer all three bullet points equally. Remember that you should not copy from the text. It says using your own words, right? So if you copy from the text, you will lose marks. Equally, do not quote from the text either. 
Bullet point three is often implicit, not clearly stated. You will have to use your own brain and guesswork for it. Do not make anything random up. Um, remember that you get marks for content points, which is the information from the text summarized using your own words. For details, which is the explicit information from the text that you could easily highlight, the who, what, where, when. And for development, which is inferred information, such as how something happened, why something happened, or your feelings. Remember to identify the VORP of your question before you get going so that you use an accurate register for the context. And remember, if it's an interview, um, you do not need an introduction or a conclusion. And for an interview, they will give you just three questions. Only use those three questions. Don't add anything extra on. Aim to write at least five different things for each bullet point so that you can try to maximize your marks. In order to get a very good mark, you need to have three correct content points for each of the bullet points. You must try to sound like the character or voice that you've been asked to assume. Check that very carefully. Who have you been asked to write as? What evidence is there in the text for how they write? A hint, it will never be very informal. It will never be slung. It will never be, oh my God, anyways, it will never be that. It will either be formal or semi-formal. And remember to write just one paragraph per bullet point so that you can quite clearly see whether or not you have actually answered those questions equally. I hope that my tips and tricks were useful for you. Um, there will be a walkthrough video coming up. So in my next video, I will do a full timed paper one. So the video will be like two and a half hours long at least. So make sure that if you do do that walkthrough that you've got lots of time to do that. Print off the paper and we will do it together timed. I will remind you of all of these tips as we go along and I will also help you stay on pace with some timers like, okay, now we're moving on to this question, now we're moving on to this question. And then at the end of the video, we will actually mark the paper together so you can try to figure out what mark you might have got. And you can also ask any questions in the comments for that walkthrough too. Like if you're not sure if you would have got a mark for question 2C or whatever, just comment below and I can try and help you there. So I really hope that I will see you over there on my paper one walkthrough, which is coming out in a few days. Do subscribe to my YouTube channel. Do check out my website, totally.co.uk. It's great if I do say so myself and hopefully I'll see you next time.